Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Virtual Virtual Trek Con's third third <laughs> science Hello, quiz show. Welcome back to I'm Mohammed Noor. I'm a biology professor at Duke University, and I'm an occasional science consultant for Star Trek Universe. Uh, how about Dr. Amory next? I am a medical doctor, so I get to be in charge of the um, medical questions, which uh, we'll see. They might be a little bit easier this week depending on who you ask. But um, as we always say, it's anybody's game the whole time. We've really had people is. come in and win second half. Meteorologist Katie. Yes, I am not a doctor, but I'm fun anyway. Uh, Very so, fun. <laughs> yes, I'm meteorologist Katie Nicola. The name gives gives it away. I am an actual meteorologist, so I'm covering the physical sciences and all the zany weather things that you can possibly pluck from Star Trek. <laughs> and we have lots of great people in the chat. So mm -hmm. we're just saying hi to a couple of folks there. There's David Gregory. There's uh, Ordog Heim. It's Anne Marie, who's also here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> a lot of other folks. Hey. Too. Chuck A., George Charlumbos, and many, many of our other friends there. Welcome back. So let me remind folks about the, the rules and the process here. And we have a couple of new folks here, hopefully, too. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you some questions. And these are questions that are the intersection of science and Star Trek. What you're supposed to do is, is go into the chat, the YouTube chat, and type in the answer. And the first three, just like Science Quiz Show 3, the first three people who answer get a point for that round. And we're going to have something like 20-ish rounds. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Dr. Anne-Marie made a great point earlier that it really is anybody's game. Even if somebody starts off in the lead, sometimes they'll drop back. So really go ahead and do it. We have three prizes this time. Again, magic number Ooh. for today. <laughs> Oh, and Art. also it's the first three people who show up on StreamYards in case there's ever like a disturbance oh, yeah. with YouTube. Yes. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. So actually you might type in the chat and you might think you typed in first, but there's often a slight delay. So it's going to be who we see on our screen as the first three people, which won't necessarily match who it looks like on your screen. I apologize for that. So our top prizes are another mask from Walking Art Made by Melissa yes. by our great friend Melissa Longo. She makes excellent, very high quality masks. I use this mask all the time. You're not going to get this one. This one's mine. But <laughs> we have a fresh one sent directly to you. <laughs> Another one of the top prizes. This time I'm actually going to do something a little different than something that was requested in the first one. I'm going to mail off a copy of my book. Oh, Live my gosh. To teach us about genetics, evolution, and life on other worlds. So Can some I lucky play winner. now? I, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have like so many tabs in it on my bookcase. And it's also like one of the 10 books I keep on display. Oh, you guys are so very pretty. sweet. You guys are very sweet. <laughs> and then third place will be Rice Aroni, the San Francisco. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's not. <laughs> third place will be a little Biotrecky magnet, one of these little guys here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my favorite magnet. See, I keep mine at work, and you can actually see it in the back of some of our broadcasts if they do a wide enough shot. Ooh. Um, Easter egg. I have to try to check that Little out. Easter That's eggs. very cool. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. One other thing, too, is anybody who's won a prize previously, you're still welcome to compete, but we're not going to send you another prize. So we're, we're basically trying to broaden out to the most possible people get prizes. I apologize for that because I know it's a little sad if you're like, but I just got one of those little magnets and I want one of blocks. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're sorry. trying to just get as many people as possible to get prizes. So I apologize. Especially since we have so many people in the comments section. My yes. gosh. Oh, it's very this thing's exciting. popping. <laughs> It's very exciting. Oh, I see some people actually want the magnet too. It's very nice. Yeah, <laughs> the magnet's awesome. Oh, David Gregory is very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think, is there anything else we need to go? Oh, actually, there is one other thing that I wanted to mention. Give me hmm. one second. I just need to adjust the slide first so I can pull it up. There we go. There. Hey! Hey! Just wanted to uh, point out that the seventh rule is doing a fundraiser right now. Uh, this is through their Indiegogo, so please support our one of our favorite uh, YouTube shows out there. So take a moment and give them some support. Even one dollar can potentially make a difference for them. So please mm -hmm. give them some love. Uh, you guys have any any other thoughts, or are we ready to actually get started on the questions? Ready to go? <laughs> okay, meteorologist Katie, you're up first. Are you ready? Fantastic. Yes, ready to go. Right. Let's dive right in. All right. In Star Trek The Next Generation, what is the name of the device that manipulates the weather on Earth to prevent natural disasters? Ooh. And while people are thinking up their answers, fun fact, 
there is a very high likelihood that this could never happen. Hate to burst that bubble, but holy cow, the energy you would need to create this. Oh, man. Like, you'd have to have all the power of a Dyson sphere, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, we have a couple of answers starting to pop up. The Risa machine. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. I think we'll take a couple of answers as they're uh, typed out that are close enough if that works for you guys. Sure, sure. No, I mean, yeah, your question, your call. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I see a lot of answers already popping up. So the actual answer, uh, technically speaking in canon, is weather control net or network. So weather network is pretty much the answer. <laughs> we have Chuck A, we have George C, and also, honestly, weather grid makes sense. Weather grid works for me. <laughs> David Gregory coming in. So the first two of our previous winners, but uh, David Gregory is a new one, so... <laughs> All right. So question Ooh. for scoring purposes. Do we still do points? I know what you're going to ask. I'm not, you pick either way. <laughs> I know exactly okay. what you're going to ask. <laughs> I'll do that. That way it's easier. <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Right. Any other thoughts? That was really cool. I love that one. Mm -hmm. I wish we could have something like that. Because then I would just yeah. have a tornado in my front yard all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs help? Like decorations. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> All righty. Well, the second question is mine. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in there. What are the building blocks of proteins called? These are referenced by Q in the Next Generation's finale, All Good Things. So the building blocks of proteins. Mm. Now, I'm really surprised more biology classes don't ref Star Trek, like in high school yeah. and college. I only had one teacher that referenced it once, and it was with Tribbles, and it was with yeah. the Punnett Square. But it's like, uh -huh. they talk about a lot of sciencey stuff. Yeah. Use it. <laughs> I know. I'm with you. I mean, I teach a class called Genetics Evolution Star Trek, where we actually use uh, Star Trek to teach all these lessons. Oh, exactly. we've got lots of good answers in wow. here. Oh, and I see the, the person who got it first is actually a PhD in biology, too. <laughs> hey! <laughs> so the correct answer there is indeed amino acids. Now, I know some people might have thought right after that, well, building blocks, wouldn't that be DNA? No. DNA is like the set of instructions that help actually basically identify what proteins are going to go in what order, or sorry, what building blocks are going to go in what order. But the actual building the blocks themselves for proteins are amino acids. And proteins really are like the workhorses of cells. So when you think about anything that's providing structure or things like enzymes or antibodies or things that are transporting molecules, those tend to be proteins in your body. And Kudos to Star Trek. They got that. They got that correct when they were uh, talking about it in that episode. <laughs> so, and we're th definitely thinking about antibodies a lot right now, too, for mm -hmm. unfortunate reasons. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, who are the winners for that one? Uh, for that one, we have da, 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 Gen M, number Dr. one. Gen M. <laughs> Dr. Gen M. Yeah. Uh, Linda Endereg. Endereg. Linda A and yep. Louise, or not cool. Louise, George uh, George C. <laughs> George C. Yeah, there we George go. C is a past winner, as is, as is uh, Linda too. <laughs> yes. Jen M is new. <laughs> She's played before though too. Cool. Dr. Anne Marie, are you ready to go? Okay. Here's our first one. What does Warp Oops. refer to as a Sorry. warrior's drink? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a push to try to get kids to drink healthier things <laughs> i know yeah they didn't say like seven up <laughs> drink your oval tea <laughs> oh okay. yeah there's an explosion so we have a of bunch. answers there oh. yes okay so the answer is prune juice which there have been some theories that it actually also makes more happier because it makes him more regular um, <laughs> I love that. I love, I love, I love everybody's head cannon, but I do have to say, um, there are two reasons why it does that. One is that it has fiber, so it kind of bulks up, helps things like go through more easily. Um, and there's some theory that like eating a high fiber diet actually can lower your chances of getting colorectal cancer. So that's huh? one good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, a good, a good secret for warriors, not getting cancer. Um, yeah. and then yeah. if they live that long, number two, um, it has sorbitol, which is a sugar alcohol. And that sort of, oh. um, pulls in more water into the, uh, digestive tract as things move through. Um, so 
by osmosis. So those powers combined. Those powers combined. Mm -hmm. All right. Prune juice is it. Who are our winners? Now, those seem like they just all exploded all at once. I see. I love Hoppla. the. Yeah, I love uh, <laughs> yes. War Dog Hines answer here, by the way. Doctor Fox. There you go. <laughs> well, that's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, our winners for that round is Lib in Space. We also have George C. and Drakrex. Okay. We have two previous winners. Marina <laughs> Kropchak. All right. Are you good to go, uh, meteorologist Katie? All good to go. All right. All right. On the holodeck, you can simulate any kind of weather. Who did Wesley Crusher accidentally hit in the face with a snowball while playing on the holodeck? I just watched this episode. Yeah. <laughs> like within question. the past two weeks. <laughs> well, and the funny thing is, is a lot of people think this is a mistake because you're on the holodeck, you throw a snowball. How does the snowball get outside the holodeck? Well, actually, the holodeck uses a, a lot of holographic images, but they also can use replicated items mm. to help enhance the, the environment that you're creating. So mm. the snow is actually replicated. Mm. Wonderful not there. explanation. Yeah, it would be problematic if you ate something in the holodeck and it wasn't that way because it would like, vanish out of here. Oh, <laughs> God. You're so, why am I hungry? Well, that's <laughs> one of the things I was talking about. We will get to the, the winners in a second, but one of the things that I was talking about with my friend was if you stay on the holodeck long enough and you only eat holographic food for like 10 years and then you leave the holodeck wouldn't you become a hologram because you're entirely made up of holographic food oh i love it, uh, it up. <laughs> but we do have the winners here with picard definitely you got that disgruntled patrick stewart like hmm, yes. what is this child doing uh mm -hmm. but yes so war dog heim david gregory and Go uh gilinda i keep gilinda. messing up that name but yes uh yeah <laughs> are the winners nice nice good job you guys <laughs> I believe I'm up Fun next. Question. All right, so back to back to bio. In the original series episode, Errand of Mercy, Spock described the Organians as, quote, as far above us on the evolutionary scale, we're going to talk about that in a minute, <laughs> as we are above the blank. Fill in the blank. <laughs> what did he compare them to? Mm. Every time we do this, I have to. I keep thinking in my head, I have to go back and rewatch these episodes. <laughs> <laughs> the rewatch never ends. <laughs> yeah, the rewatch never ends. I love it. That's a good uh, cue yeah. alteration there. <laughs> okay, we have some different answers coming in. We have ants and bacteria mm. and cavemen. Okay, I think we've got. We've almost got three of the right answer now. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> <laughs> yep okay we got three now the correct answer there was indeed amoeba that's like so when in doubt really... guess amoeba it comes up a lot in star trek it yes. does they have the space amoeba too in the original series too <laughs> so it's an interesting thing because people talk about like things that are, are oh they're that's more advanced than, or that's or we're we're almost always considered to be the top of the evolutionary ladder quote mm -hmm. unquote but i mean that's a that's really a misnomer right Basically, mm -hmm. life started on Earth somewhere around 4 billion years ago. Since that time, every lineage has been evolving and changing and becoming, you know, different than it was. You know, if, and people say, well, you're the only ones who can uh, build nuclear missiles or go to Mars. Okay, yeah, we can do that. But we can't, like, echolocate. We can't, you know, sense electrical signals out there. We, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we can't do that other species out, out there can do. Amoebas are shapeshifters. They're like Odo. There you go. <laughs> we can't do that. And if That's you, and the, the other example I like to give is, you know, if you put an amoeba in really tough uh, conditions, it'll form this hardened cyst and just sit there. You know, you put us like out in the Arctic, what happens? We just die, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, they're much more advanced than us in many respects. Yes. So it's just something to think about nice. in the context of like more advanced, this ladder of evolution. It's a misnomer, but <laughs> just wanted to toss that out there. <laughs> hmm. They just so have the ones who got that right. I saw multiple people get it right there. Yes, um, let me pull it back up here. Yeah, we have Louise A, we have Linda A, and we have David Gregory. Okay, good. I like it. Dr. Anne Marie, are you good to go? I am good to go. All right, let's dive in for the next one. How did Bajoran religious leaders read someone's paw? I just wonder, is it you pronounce or it paw or is, that like, is there a, a sound at the end? I've never been quite sure. Um, I think it's just paw. Okay. The founders are amoebas. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also horrible at languages, so maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't remember. 
And we all know that the chat pack's paw is very strong. Yeah, they see multiple people oh. already. Okay, yes. It. All yes. right, so obviously they check your spirit, your paw, by grabbing your ear. Super weird. Um, and <laughs> so my head cannon is like, what are they actually, like, what on earth could you get by checking someone's ear? So my head cannon is maybe like, they judge how uncomfortable it makes you or how good you are at like, um, like adapting to their cultural like rituals. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe one way you can like test that is by checking like someone's uh, vital signs, maybe getting that close to them really helps you mm -hmm. check their heart rate and uh, their respiratory rate. And also you can check like if their pupils are dilated, if that's making you uncomfortable, like <laughs> something a lot of the spies do for like the FBI, CIA, all the spy organizations um, to try and see if people are lying. So that's huh. may maybe what they're getting at because I can't cool possibly stuff. think what like earlobes would do otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> your skin's so soft. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, awesome. All right. Well, I saw multiple people had the the ear answer in there. Let's take a look. Yes, we have varying degrees of grab the ear, touch mm. their ear, poke their ears. Uh, but the top three oh, were uh, <laughs> Chuck A, Dracorex, <laughs> and also live in space. Uh, live okay, space and that's making a good uh, yeah. start here. <laughs> some aggressive paw checking if you poke yeah. them. <laughs> So I, uh, for your next one, um, you draw us, Katie. I did add the picture you had asked me for. Brilliant! Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you ready to go? Oh yes, all ready. Awesome. Awesome. So in the Badlands, which were used by the Maquis to hide from their enemies, are known for this type of storm that resembles fire tornadoes on screen. Mm, it's very. It does resemble a fire tornado. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it does. And that. Fire tornadoes are actual things. They happen near wildfires. And really? that upward lift from the heat, it's a heat source. So it causes that rising motion and you can get fire whirls. Um, wow. One of which I believe wow. was rated an EF2 in California recently. Uh -huh. And so we know from they previous don't move. show that's the um, third highest of the tornado scale. <laughs> yes, ah, there you are. All we right, well, we have Amazing. a ton of people already <laughs> answering. Uh, it's it, a lot of people saying ion storms, but actually, it's plasma storms. Mm. Little tricks there. Um, mm -hmm. But no, some for some it's potato potato. But plasma storm is the yeah. correct answer. So we have War Dog Heim, Jen M, Doctor Jen M, and mm. David Gregory. <laughs> Yep, you, apparently you, you yes. did. Good job, Dr. Jen. <laughs> it pays nice. to rewatch before doing these quiz shows. <laughs> yeah. No, you only have like 800 some to do. So it's, yes. it's yeah, you, can, you can squeeze it in. <laughs> 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 okay, I guess I'm up next. So let me, I'll jump right in there. <gasps> what is the molecule used for energy in cells that was referenced in the Voyager episode, Sacred Ground? Hmm. Molecule used for energy in cells. My favorite molecule. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's come up a couple of other times too, but the, 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 it for sure got mentioned with the full name right there in that episode. Hmm. Let's see if some people get that one. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking and realizing, you know, if I wasn't on the show, I would not be winning the show because I am. <laughs> Woo! You can type fast. You can just well, you don't it, know. Like, it's still everybody's cells. game. <laughs> True. <laughs> Take a guess. Take a wild guess. Yeah, no, it's true. Oh, oh, and we we got some coming. I like I like this answer. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I see several people have gotten it correctly. The correct answer is indeed ATP or adenosine triphosphate. <laughs> My favorite. <Woo! laughs> so respiration in the mitochondria of our cells. Remember, mitochondria are called the powerhouses of cells. <laughs> the mighty mitochondria. The mighty yeah, mitochondria. I remember. They produce ATP from ADP, so adenosine triphosphate from adenosine diphosphate. So cells will take in like sugar and um, and uh, and oxygen, and then they'll break down the sugar into carbon dioxide, water, and they'll take that ADP and make it into ATP. Then when you need energy, that chemical bond is broken from ATP to make it back to ADP. So it basically it's this hmm. back and forth thing to, to give us energy when we need it. Very cool. And yay, Star Trek for mentioning it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And so, the uh, winners from that round. For that one? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, the first, uh, first people were Carol Corns. We also mm -hmm. had George C. and Dracorex. Awesome. Awesome. We got, we got some people who are kick, kicking butt here. Oh, I like this. 
All I got is Krebs cycle. <laughs> ah, yes. These latent memories, they're just popping up from AP Bio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Are you all set, Anne-Marie? Dr. Anne-Marie? I am. Okay. All right. Now we're getting to the medium questions. What yeah. type of medical procedure was used in an attempt to determine who might be an undercover changeling? Oh, Carol Corns remembers this. Glycolysis is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just calling procedure anything possibly invasive or like touching you. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I'll, uh, I think we have three so far. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so it is blood screenings. So they would check the color of your blood and make sure it looks like blood. So like red liquid instead of that gold changeling fluid. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Wow. People got that yeah. fast. They got that super fast. <laughs> well, and Live in Space is the first one. Then we had George C. and Dracorex again. I always want to see like way more different blood colors besides just yeah. the gold when they take it out of like all the various aliens, but we don't get to see that that often in no. space. Well, I think at Dorian's we saw it blue blood, right? I think I yes. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Meteorologist Katie, you're up. Are you good? Ready. All right. All right. What temperature in Fahrenheit, Celsius, or Kelvin is equal to absolute zero? This is a fun one because, fun fact, space isn't actually at absolute zero. Uh -huh. Because at absolute zero, everything stops all molecular motion ceases. I was going to make that so, point too. You, you already hit it. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that I learned early on when I was a Star Trek fan because I was in all these like science classes. I was like, yeah. wait a second. Then what's the actual temperature of space? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, right. I we like already have answer. some answers. I don't know. <laughs> hey, you're honest. That's okay. Sure. I think we have, I think we have uh, enough correct ones now, right? We do. We have Carol Corns coming in at zero Kelvin. Then we also have um, negative 273 degrees uh, Celsius. And then we also have negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. So some interesting little differences depending on where in the world you are and what Fahrenheit, Celsius, or Kelvin scale you use. But the winners on that one are Carol Corns, George C., and Dr. Jen M. All right. Good mix of folks in there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You. Thanks, you guys. So uh, I'll warn people, this next one is from the current season, the one airing right now of Star Trek Discovery. It's not a big deal, though. So if you if you like, it's not like a spoiler. It's just the, it's just something that comes up. But if people are like, I don't want to know anything about it, then please like mute <laughs> your show right now. <laughs> All right. Jumping in with that one. The question is, what is the mineral that some birds are born with? that helps them detect true north mentioned in the in the so uh, awesome. first episode of season four episode or season four of discovery let's see what is this mineral called that helps them detect true north i just imagine a lot of people around the world right now just like crap, 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 like <laughs> furiously <laughs> tapping their desks like what is it yep <laughs> I like this answer. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, uh, not that one. <laughs> Eggs. No, this is true. They do. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, we have we have Ooh. some variation in answers there. Yeah, a lot of variation. And a couple people. And I want, I want the on their precise keyboard. answer in this case, just in case that helps. I want the precise answer. Oh. So if you've typed and you want to type again, feel free. <laughs> yes. Now, is this a medium level question? This is a medium level question. Yeah. I thought Ooh. maybe it should be hard. <laughs> <laughs> this is me just thinking, oh boy, what? I would not get this one. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I think, I think we've got it. Uh, all right. The correct answer is magnetite. So I mean, a lot of people got oh. like iron magnetic. People got that, but if you wanted to see magnetite, that's the name of that mineral in there. And it, it's really cool that they have this in their in their heads to help actually orient, or at least it's the, at least that's the perceived function for it. Because I mean, it is there. And a lot of a lot of species out there do actually sense magnetic fields. This is another one of those cases referring back to our previous point about you know how how top of the evolutionary ladder are we? <laughs> I mean, there's various insects, there's various fish, there's various turtles. 
you know, birds, as we mentioned, they can actually sense north, you know, through these magnetic fields. And people have done studies to try to disrupt it to see if that's the case, where they'll, like, for example, take a sea turtle and put, like, this, like, electromagnet around it and see if they can, like, orient the wrong direction. So mean. Wrong oh, that's or, or so bad. Remember some ones with, like, strapping a magnet to the back of a pigeon's head and see if it goes the wrong way. Oh, thing. my gosh. <laughs> So, not the best experiments, but it, it at least proved oh, the point. And, you know, they were never hurt. I mean, like, this was just a very temporary thing. Like, okay, got it. Now That's like some it. Amelie movie level messing with the animals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a little I'm bit sure after <laughs> cool. So, who are our winners on that one? Our winners are Dracrex, George C., and Wardogheim. Awesome. I like that. Test their poop for magnetite. <laughs> You ready, Dr. Emery? Yeah. All right. What planet was Data created on? <gasps> what is Data created on? Ooh. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It was not Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ruled out one. <laughs> not the Jupiter station. Not the Jupiter station either, <laughs> but not the planet Jupiter. <laughs> You've been a very interesting species or a different, uh, different sort of android if you've been built on Jupiter. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> that one, the crystalline planet. entity eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, the crystalline entity All right, we need eight. one more. Ooh. We got some different Greek letters going here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like the addenda or theta. <laughs> <laughs> After this, let's do a quick okay. recap on scores. KK. Okay, we got them. Sounds good. So yes, Omicron Theta, which obviously we're including um, just to help us remember how to say Omicron since there's been yeah. a lot of discussion yes. in the news recently. Um, and somebody did an amazing cut of connection. Star Trek where like every single um, time Omicron is said in Star Trek, oh, yeah. like 90, 95% of the people said Omicron versus Omicron. Mm. But yes, that is the unfortunate connection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yep. Star Trek can always uh, keep teaching us. Nope. That's exactly. one of the things when we're reporting on it every day at my station, and I'm just sitting in the back, violently shaking back and forth, like, "Why can't you say Greek letters right?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> For all know. of us who like weren't in fraternities or sororities, but watched a lot of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh but yes i do have a score update uh for okay. anyone who's interested so going well, in who wants this round first oh this round uh dracorex followed up by live in space and then carol Quartz. awesome thank you all right yes. score update now this is fun all right so we have chuck a at two points david gregory at four points mm -hmm. dracorex at six points mm -hmm. we also have galinda b at one george c at seven mm -hmm. Gen dr jen m at three we have mm -hmm. linda and and linda a at mm -hmm. two louise a at one war dog heim at three live in space four and carol corns three so a lot of tight scoring differences here yeah yeah we might need some tiebreakers <laughs> i like it yeah cool all right are you are you good to go sorry to hit you up three times in a row there. Okay. oh no i'm good <laughs> all right thank you meteorologist kitty <laughs> All right. What record weather event is believed to be the cause of the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion? It is something that is very much discussed in interplanetary meteorology, if that's a thing. Anyone who's interested in, you know, space and meteorology combined, because this was one of those main events. And I'm sure you guys remember it happening. I very much remember it happening. <laughs> I remember I was home watching some game show that was not Price is Right, and uh, it got interrupted oh. to, with that with that update. <laughs> Interesting. See, back when they would be like breaking news, and then you just have like that sinking feeling, like wait a second, yeah. this is actual breaking news, not uh, Lincoln Riley's going to USC or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not spicy or anything. Interesting answers here. Yeah, I know it's variety. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are getting. I, I see hmm. one that I think would count as as correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, uh, and to explain, the O-rings did break, but what caused them to break? Yeah. It's a weather event. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is a weather event. 
Badlands Plasma Storm. I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Man, I should have put this one as a hard one. It's a simple word, at least. There we go. Okay, we'll take <laughs> nice. it. The uh, The answer was cold or freezing temperatures because it got so cold that it constricted those O-rings and caused them to break. So oh, record cold temperatures. They talk about this in For All Mankind, too. With really? Mm, another connection. Interesting. <laughs> so, so good. Yes, so the uh, correct answers, who had them? David Gregory had one. Uh, we also had uh, Galinda B. and Carol Corns. All right. Those are three new names, too. None of them have won right. before, I believe. It's anybody's yeah, game yeah. until, like, the last it question. Really, it really is. Oh, honestly, really yeah. <laughs> All right. I believe I'm up next. So I'll jump in. This is an Enterprise one. I had to get one of those in there. Good. <laughs> in the Enterprise, the Zindi. Flox describes the approximately 99% genetic similarity between Zindi types as similar to human and what other thing? Now, I'm, notice I'm saying Flox describes as. I'm sure you could come up with other answers, but, <laughs> but what Flox yeah. says. <laughs> I don't know about Flox. you guys, but I loved the Zindi arc. Oh, I oh. did too. I'm glad you said that because so... some people were like, oh, I hated it. I was like, I loved it. I thought it was great. <laughs> it is so underrated. Like, yeah. oh, I love it so much. Yeah, a lot of people are saying chimpanzees. It's a good guess, but it's not what Flock said. <laughs> Amoeba. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Default guess. I don't. I don't know if we have any even individual genes that have ninety nine percent similar to an amoeba, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wonder if this will even get three people at this point. <laughs> I'll give a hint. It is it is a hominid still. A true hominid. I see, I see we have yeah, we have some successes now coming in. <laughs> yes, I agree. I love Degra too. I was so sad when he got killed. Oh Spoiler my alert. Gosh. <laughs> I yelled at my screen. Oh, oh his relationship no, with Dad, Archer. God. Ah, it kills me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not sufficiently specific. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, this is a tricky one. I think we, yeah, we got three now. <laughs> The correct answer is Neanderthal or Neanderthal, as some people say. <laughs> so this was an interesting thing, right? Because um, these are these Zindi, you know, there's some like they were insectoid or reptilian or or cetacean. <laughs> They're genetically as similar as us are as we are to Neanderthal. So that really that was a stretch to say the to say the least. I mean, yeah, there should what be is like that one percent coding for? Right, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> everything. <Yeah. laughs> but you know, we, we, basically, like, there should be hundreds of millions of years difference between anything that looks human versus anything that looks reptilian. Because I think that was, that was the specific comparison that was made there. Whereas we were like humans were actually interbreeding with Neanderthal just in the past hundred thousand years. In fact, anybody who doesn't have straight pure african ancestry probably has some fraction maybe between one and five percent neanderthal ancestry in their genome so pretty that. cool so who are our wins awesome. on that one i remember uh, we M had was the first one yes dr jen was number one we had live yeah. in space and carol corns oh nice awesome all right dr amory you good to go i am what was Beverly Crusher's nickname at Starfleet Academy? Or I got easy to Now looking at the score sheet here, everything's so spread out. I love it. Nice. This is a highly this is probably one of the most competitive ones we've had. Nice. I love it. <laughs> okay, we got it. So awesome. her nickname is The Dancing Doctor, which <laughs> I just love because, first of all, Dr. Crusher is amazing. Second of all, I think it shows how healthy she is and like um, well-rounded Renaissance man slash woman. And mm -hmm. yeah. it's really nice to have like outlets when you have such rigorous study, like which isn't always possible. Mm -hmm. But I just think it helps you see how um, 
just like a complete person she is and sometimes totally. people complain like she's just sort of like a potted plant i feel like those little details just make, oh, her, so, make her so real awful. yeah she just she's just the best so <laughs> And I it's a good reminder to do hobbies. <laughs> I'm not going to highlight that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to let that one go. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, the winners for that round <laughs> are Louise A., Chuck A., and Live in Space. Awesome. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Cool. Are you good to go, Meteorologist Katie? I'm all good to go. <laughs> awesome. You're on. All right. The Utopia Planitia shipyards are located on Mars. What is the no average temperature on the surface of Mars? Underline average temperature. We'll take plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius. So have a little bit of an Whoa. advantage if you're guessing in Celsius. Honestly, cold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> plus or minus 10. That's hard. <laughs> it's not bad. It's it's a tough, it's okay. I'm so bad at this. Google search can't make. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, little little fun facts popping up here. The Mars isn't as temperature extreme as we think. A lot of times we see temperatures on Mars that are similar to what we have on Earth at, in parts and at times. There's just a little asterisk next to it, but. It's not too bad. Also, and this is from Mohammed because I have to give credit where credit is due. The temperature on the demon planet in Voyager, put this into perspective, was around 500 Kelvin. So Kelvin, for anyone who doesn't know, is a ridiculously high temperature scale. Um, yeah, that you burn. <laughs> wow. I was about Absolutely. to do a demon, a demon planet question. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe I'm next seeing time. I'm seeing some answers here that are. I apologize. Getting I interrupted close. you when you were speaking earlier, uh, Katie. I apologize for that. Oh, you did? I did. Oh, when you were reading the question off, I interrupted you. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we have enough here. The answer is either, well, technically it is minus 81, negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 62 degrees Celsius. But that's just the average temperature. It changes dramatically depending on where you're at. If you're, say, right near the equator, for instance, the temperature can actually get up on a summer day to around 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius, like a wow. normal day. And that's then a nice you have day. Exactly. But if you go to the poles, it could be like negative 195 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's, just, it's one of those weird planets where you see the temperatures really changing. Yeah, which makes sense because of the lack of atmosphere, right? Or it's like this is a exactly. very, very thin atmosphere. So you can get those massive, it's like, it's like on the moon. Like if you're on the dark side versus the light side, it's dramatically different in temperature. Oh yeah, exactly. So if we can build atmospheres on planets, then we can maybe make things feel a little bit better. Yeah, but we have there is the lack of a magnetic field as well as the... Um, the How will the gravity. birds fly in the right direction? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think I uh, scrolling through, Dracorex had 80 below. Um, War Dogheim had uh, 70 below in Celsius. And then also we had uh, 80 below Carol Corns. So mm -hmm. I'll take those. Yeah. Anybody's game still. <laughs> oh, yes. These scores are close. All right. So this next one, I'm uh, I'm up, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in Voyager, once upon a time, the EMH, that's the doctor, described the process that led to the formation of mitochondria. What is this process called? Ooh, this is this is a, this is a tough one. There's a, there's I'll, there's a second answer I would take, but there's a there's a best mm -hmm. answer too. But I'll take the second answer if somebody does it. Oh, interesting. I need Very to get better on my says. Voyager episode title name. Yeah. Not Big Bang. Not quite that early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit after that. <laughs> oh, I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. I So one of my – actually, my first ever Comic-Con that I went to was in Chicago. And Robert Duncan McNeil was there, and someone dressed up as the the lizard mom's lizard baby. Oh my god! Uh, after going to Warp Ten, and showed it to him, it was the greatest thing. Like it was a quality That's costume. Epic. That's epic. Oh, I want to know floor? who they are. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, they could wobble and they could wiggle, and I was just like, oh my god. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. 
This is a good made up word. I like it. <laughs> sounds scientific. It works. sounds like it could be right. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, while we're waiting for people to type um, things, no. I'll be back. Oh. <laughs> I'll oh, be no. back um, in Chicago at C2E2 next weekend. Uh, so if there's any nice. Star Trek people, I know there's a couple of attendee cosplayers who are going. Uh, but if anyone watching is going, hit me up. I'd love to meet up. All right, we've been uh, sitting on this one for a while, so I'm just going to stop. Oh, actually, we got two in there now, so we'll, we'll just stop yeah. with that. <laughs> so the All correct right. answer is, we're not going to take anywhere after this point now. The correct answer is endosymbiotic theory or symbiogenesis. I take either of those. Ooh. So it's an interesting thing because, like, this is back in the in the era when everything living on Earth was single cell, and you basically had one single cell organism essentially swallow a bacteria, and that bacteria actually was. It was in some way giving it this ATP, this energy that then it could use to power itself. So it would reproduce inside that cell. And when the cell split, that bacteria also split too. So like some got into the other one. Eventually over time, that bacteria became what is now called the mitochondria. But if you look, actually, the mitochondria still has a little bit of its own genome that's distinct from our nuclear so genome. Cool. So it's really cool because it, wow. you know, it's a much reduced genome because it gets a lot of what it needs from the host cell. But it does have its own little genome in there. So that's a very, very nice. cool uh, Some very of the cool, cool things process. like <laughs> very rarely causes like a disease with the mitochondrial DNA. And then you can also trace it to the maternal line. Oh, interesting. Oh. Yeah. But anyway, that's probably what allowed for us to become multicellular. So that that's that's pretty good. I'm glad that happened. <laughs> so cool. Wow. So I think well, we had Jen M, Dr. Jen M, and was it Carol Corns? I think that's who it was. Live in space. Oh, live in space. Actually. That's who it was. That's who it was. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, Carol Corns asks, uh, where in Chicago? It's at McCormick Place yeah. next weekend. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> Isn't that where the next Star Trek convention is? Yes, in, oh, yeah, in, that's right. Back uh, in April. Yeah, Ooh, I'm very just, excited. Let's scout it out. This place. I'm <laughs> yeah, honestly, hey, you guys should totally go. It's an amazing convention. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Anne Marie, you're up. Okay. Um, in '90s track, what instrument do doctors typically use to repair slash heal skin wounds? Mm. I know this I just one. said 90s because I didn't double check uh, um, the other ones. And I know that in lower ducts, for example, they ha they talk about skin grafting, which mm. I'm pretty sure is also still in use in 90s track. <laughs> Magic wow. wand. You can take some of these <laughs> answers, Dr. Henry. <laughs> um, okay. I like a medallion's one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is okay, yeah, we have, fruit? I'd say we have three, dermal regenerator. Um, so you see like Beverly and Dr. Bashir and the EMH use it quite often. And they just kind of like um, move it over above the skin and that heals cuts or burns. And I guess you can use it to um, like get the skin tissue back to normal after some surgical reconstruction or looking like another alien, um, which I mean, obviously this would be amazing if we could ever... Uh, invent something like it because no scars. I cool. like my scars though. They tell <laughs> such a good story. Like yeah. this one I got from cutting a Christmas bulb with a knife trying to make a cosplay. Well, then chosen such. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, who are we at? Uh, yes, we have Live in Space with one point, Louise A with another point, and rounding out, Galinda B. All right. Meteorologist Katie, I think this this coming up one's your last question, I believe. All right. Uh -huh. All right. What is the name for the U.S. weather observation satellites that are currently orbiting and observing the weather around Earth? This one, yeah, I, I put it as a hard one, but for anyone who follows weather, definitely should get this one pretty easily because these this program, there are 17 of these now that have been sent up into space. So cool. <laughs> And you can see them free online. You can just log on and look at the earth anytime you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dupler. Uh... Ooh, it's, it is actually a name of a program, not a government agency. Also fun fact, but it is an acronym. Ah, I'll take the nice, full nice thing or an acronym. <laughs> Oh man, this is why I put it as a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> it's okay. Close. No. Close. Good. 
Um, maybe. Maybe yes, I didn't uh... even get through an answer, so it's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love oh, that I don't yeah. know them, and then I get to learn. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and it's it's cool. I might be able to share a link or something um, when I give you guys the answer, because highly recommend if there's ever a storm, you can just log on, click on the satellite, and view the storm from space. It is amazing. Nice. I think... Nice. <laughs> oh, no. A lot of people saying my cat, which I isn't isn't too bad. But we do have a couple of answers. I see two. We just need one more. That is correct. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think, should we cut it off or should sure. we let them go? Okay. So we're cutting it off on this one. The answer is GOES, Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. And that is a system that we use. Go 16 is the main one. We just launched Go 17 and it is like HD views of storms. You can see the clouds bubbling. It is one of the coolest programs. So just type in Go 16 imagery. It's amazing. That's so wow. cool. That's so, so cool. Great question too. I love the Weather meets space. Yeah. <laughs> this is our last awesome. uh, quiz show for the virtual TrekCon series. So we have to make this one... <laughs> <Challenge Yeah. first. laughs> well and the winners for that one were dracorex and we also had war.com fantastic oh that one doesn't actually change it oh. both of them are past winners <laughs> yes that's true all right i think i'm up next in tng second chances crusher rules out that tom Riker is a clone of will by saying there's been no blank which is actually an expression for random fluctuations in the number of gene variants in a population. This is definitely a hard one. Mm. <laughs> it's probably easier to get it from Not the science clearly. part than than for the than from the Trek part, unless you really know that Trek episode. <laughs> mm. A lot of people saying mutations. <laughs> I'm guess guessing that's not the answer. That's not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> So there's random fluctuations in numbers, not arisal of it. Hmm. I think we have we actually have three now. I'll take it. So I, it hey. it's okay that it doesn't have the it didn't have the first word and so it's a good job, you guys. The correct answer is genetic drift. And I'll take drift. That's that's good enough because a lot of people in, in the field will say uh, just say drift about it. I catch your drift. Yeah, I catch your drift. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> So this was actually an error because this has actually come up also in one episode of um, Deep Space Nine. I think Bashir says at one point in time where he's looking at somebody's DNA sequence saying, I don't see any genetic drift. That doesn't actually work. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Genetic drift is, is the property of a population. It's yeah. just a like, you know, it's the, it's the idea that, for example, let's say you have uh, a particular genetic variant that happens to be common. And just by chance, it either becomes more common or less common because, you know, I don't know, someone get caught in a storm and has nothing to do with their ability to survive and reproduce, just chance events. This is of course most extreme in small populations where chance events will have a proportionately bigger thing. That's what genetic drift is. It's not something you can look at in an individual. I mean, aside from just getting killed and say, well, there's, I guess there was drift in me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's about <laughs> it, but that, like, that doesn't really, that doesn't really work. So that's, that's oh my the God. answer. Population genetics is so fun. I know, right? I love population it's genetics. So cool. it's, of course, my subfield, so that, that's I'm biased. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Who are the ones who got that first? I saw there were All some. right. Yes, we had uh, uh, Louise A, Medallion, new name thrown in, and yeah. Wardogheim. All right. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Embry, I think this next one is your last question, I believe. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. The tiebreaker so... after that, though. I think this is a bit of a hard one. How yeah. long after joining with a host did the Trill symbiont bond become irreversible? Like it hurts the host if you take it back out of the host. And this is according to Deep Space Nine because I didn't totally fact check it with the other series. Um, and we're looking Oops, for sorry. hours. I mean, is that there? Sorry about that. <laughs> it's funny, I didn't even have that window open. I don't know why that moved. <laughs> I was trying to scroll back in the chat and it just oh like. <laughs> Q. Ooh, this one's going to cause chaos. Yeah. I didn't put the answer in days because Bajor days and Earth days are different. I don't know what trill days are. Oh, oh. that's oh. good. That's a good uh, physical science aspect there. <laughs> mm, yes. <laughs> hmm. 
but one hint is it's less than four Earth days. Mm. Oh. Maybe we'll take like plus or minus five hours. Sure. Okay. So there's one so far that I see. Yay! <laughs> Oh, this is a good question. Is our universe? Yeah. I guess it depends on I what guess according to on. Star Trek. Yeah. 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 <laughs> mm. <laughs> Whenever you guys want to cut it off. We it's have one person. <laughs> Those just started typing in random numbers right now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. How long are trill days? We don't know. It's a good What's question. Sli it's slightly less than four Earth days. For a trill day? Um, for, or well, Bajor. for the answer in hours, it's slightly oh, less than four Earth days. Ah, is, is that, are we cutting it off then? <laughs> or is that um, a hint? It was a hint. Whatever you guys yeah. think. <laughs> I, guess, I think I guess we can, we can cut it off. We can cut it off. Yeah. But the person who had the answer, it's 93 hours. So Marina Kovchuk Jackarex. Oh. Huh. Was the one who said 90 hours. Um, Ew. So, yeah, they don't like completely go into specifics, but I think probably it's similar to like when Kira gets uh, <laughs> the bait, um, Kiryoshi in her in her belly. Um, they mm. say it's due to like extensive vascularization that you can't take it out. So my guess is like that has something to do with the uh, symbiont going into the host. There's just very extensive um, vascularization and maybe it messes with like the um, neurotransmitters in the host or something that would like cause a shock to the system and kill the host if they took it out. Outstanding. Science. Science <laughs> yeah. for the win. You said it was Dracorex, uh, Marina? Uh, it? Yeah. I don't, awesome. I couldn't tell if the yes. others came in after we started saying it, but yeah. Is it Dracorex or Dracorex? I know. Okay. I don't yeah, know I don't what know. it's a reference to. I don't know. <laughs> Drax. <laughs> cool so uh, let's recap the, the overall scores and see if we need a tiebreaker question i have one ready if so all right so we i will exclude the previous winners if that's all right or should yes, i please. include okay uh, well, actually, so, go and do both go and do both and then, and then okay we'll see cool we are. yeah so we have chuck a with three david gregory with five drac rex a previous winner at nine we also have galinda b at three George C, previous winner, at seven. We have Dr. Jen M at five. Then we go to Linda A, previous winner, at two. Louise A at four. Medallion with one. Wardogheim, previous winner, at six. Live in Space at eight. And Carol Corns at six. Wow. So among so, the non pre oh, yeah. Who are the top winners, I guess? Including, I believe, including the previous winners. Including the previous winners, we have at uh, number one, Dracorex. Okay. Um, so in theory, Marina winner. won, but doesn't get another prize. But good job, Marina. <laughs> yes. Uh, then we also have uh, number two, Live in Space with eight uh, uh, points. Live in Space is new. New winner. Congratulations. We also have Carol Corns with six, okay. I believe, in third place. Or no, George C. had seven, but a previous okay. winner. Yep. Good job, um, so then we go down back to Carol Corns with six for okay. second place of the non-winners. Okay. And uh, Wardogheim also had six, but is a previous winner. Okay. And then I believe we do have a tie for third okay. place with the non-winners yet. And that is David Gregory mm -hmm. tied with Dr. Jen M with oh, five points. David and Jen Ooh. M. So we got a tiebreaker. This last question. <laughs> and it's a biology one. So Jen has a little bit of an edge. So David has a has a, has a degree in anthropology. So close. <laughs> All right. So for this next one, we're going to, um, uh, we'll talk about prize in just a second. Where third prize does get the magnet. I said there was a question there about that. So that's this. Oh, sorry. No, third prize gets the magnet. Sorry. Second prize gets, uh, actually, I don't know which one's first and second. I'll decide later. <laughs> which of these two things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, let's dive in and do this last question here and see who wins between those two folks. So we're just counting David and Jen. Anybody can answer, but we're just counting David and Jen for this one. Pressure's on. Tholians are purportedly blank. 
meaning they have both male and female reproductive organs. Ooh. This is not correct. <laughs> it's not magic. <Yeah. laughs> I'm just teasing. To get a lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> male and female reproductive organs. Oh. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, I think we have a winner there. Oh, uh, there we go. Dr. Jen M. Dr. Jen M did it. Yes, the correct answer is hermaphroditic. Woo. Yeah, so this is an interesting one in the sense that that we, we tend to focus a lot on, um, you know, uh, vertebrates and mammals where there's clearly like, you know, a male and a female sex. But in fact, hermaphroditism or hermaphroditism <laughs> is actually quite common in, in a lot of other taxa. So most plants, many worms, snails, some fish, it's rare in reptiles and insects, and I don't think there's any birds or mammals known to have it. And a lot of hermaphrodites can actually self-fertilize. I don't know if that's actually true wow. for, the, for the tholians or not. I mean, it's Amory giggling because I, I always put a folian. You love tholians. I do love the tholians. <laughs> it's like Ryan and Bullion. <laughs> yeah. So we're just about out of time. So um, uh, meteorologist Katie, why don't you tell people how they can follow you? Absolutely. You guys can follow me pretty much anywhere there's social media. I'm at weather underscore Katie, K-A-T-I-E, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook, on TikTok as well, where I do most of my videos and then I just cross post them and interact with people mostly on Twitter. And I have a YouTube channel called So Many Random Fandoms because that's, that's me in a great nutshell. great one too. <laughs> well, well worth watching. <laughs> oh, thank you. Dr. Anne-Marie? I am on Twitter at Anne Marie Siegel, S E G A L, one, the number one. Um, and also, Seventh Rule, you can see me there a lot. Awesome. Fantastic. One of our favorite shows. <laughs> and I'm I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as Mafnoor, M A F N O O R. By the way, if you're a winner, shoot me a message so I know how to actually send you your prize. <laughs> so, like, Dr. Jen M, I have your contact info, but uh, some of the other folks, I'm not sure I do. So, you know, yes, just shoot live me in a message, space so. and Carol Corns. Yeah, please, both of y'all shoot me a message in some way so I can follow you. And I also have a, a YouTube channel called BioTrekkie Explains, which actually, I guess you're on that YouTube channel right now. So, you can subscribe if you like. With and a new one show last coming little, up. One last yes. little plug before we go. Just a reminder about this, that the Seventh Rule is having their Indiegogo fundraiser. So please, one dollar contributes to a great community and a great set of folks doing a great product. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for being part of the virtual TrekCon. You can go to the next video using the description box. It has a line at the top saying click here for next video. And keep on sciencing. We love you all. Bye. Bye, everyone.